sorry, um, tuberculosis. Oh. No, sorry, my telephone is ringing, but um, it's get me. Uh, so now I'm very sorry. So I I'll introduce you to epidemiology, natural history of tuberculosis, some um, discussion of the, um, the advantages and limitations of diagnostic tests, um, the diagnosis um, of latent and active tuberculosis and some principles of management. And that will be followed by more details into more complicated cases of tuberculosis. Now, what is my bacterium tuberculosis? This is an, it is an obligate pathogenic and immotile rot, which was discovered in the, at the end of the 19th century by a um, physician or microbiologist, Robert Koch. But it took more than 100 years until it was um, identified in more detail with the genome sequencing. It is generally identified by smear microscopy, and you have to do an acid fast staining, um, which we call Ziel Nielsen staining. And what you see here are the red rods identified by this um, staining. Um, one of the um, specifics of the mycobacterium um, is that it grows very slowly. The doubling time in culture is 15 to 20 hours. It is a little bit faster if you have a liquid culture, but that's why it takes several weeks until you have a definite cultural um, or culture um, confirmation of your diagnosis. And it's not always on smears like you have that you have this many um, uh, red rods, but sometimes it's very um, subtle, like single rods here on this um, microscopic field. So you have to look very carefully, but that's um, the domain of the microbiologist really. Now the natural history of tuberculosis is that it's an uh, um, infection that occurs via mostly via inhalation and mostly from adult sources by coughing and aerosol generation. And um, it is important to remember that one single mycobacteria might be sufficient to cause an infection. What happens then is that the, um, this uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis is ingested by alveolar macrophages. And these are either able to kill the mycobacterium or an inflammatory process starts now. Um, um, with initiation of or a granulomatous inflammatory process. Um, and um, either the immune system is strong enough to contain the mycobacterium and then you have latent tuberculosis or um, the infection continues and then you go on to develop active disease. The iceberg with most part of it underwater um, is a very good reflection of tuberculosis in, in our world. There are, is a lot of exposure and part of people exposed will develop infection. And of these, uh, well, up to half of the um, infected people will develop active tuberculosis disease. So there is a, very big number um, that contributes to the tuberculosis problem, but may never have overt disease. And it's important to understand this epidemiology and the natural history of this infection in order to um, do the best or develop the best prevention and treatment strategies. Worldwide, it is, it is estimated that there are more than 10 million tuberculosis cases. Um, of these cases, a very small minority is uh, reported in children, and it is estimated that almost a million children are undiagnosed, unreported, and possibly untreated. So there is a big pediatric problem in terms of tuberculosis worldwide. <laughs> 
Um, and also there is a high or large proportion or a high number of children who actually still die of tuberculosis, an estimated number of 250,000 in 2016. And again, therefore, to, to, in order to um, um, influence these numbers, it's very important to understand the risks for infection and disease in children um, uh, if you want to improve the situation. Um, there are, these are the following slides will show you some maps, which um, you can also find of the w, on the WHO website. This shows the tuberculosis incidence rates worldwide with the darkest colors um, reflecting those countries, countries with the highest incidence. Um, that is here more than 300 cases per 100,000 population. And you see that the highest incidence is really in the southern parts of Africa. However, if we look at absolute numbers, you will find that Africa still has some relatively large dots, but the ab largest absolute number of tuberculosis cases is here in India. And another way to look um, at um, the cases is to ask where are the most complicated cases and these are the cases with um, multiple drug resistance uh, we will hear about later and you see it's again another part of the world here in Russia and um, uh, neighboring countries. So there are quite a few different perspectives to look at tuberculosis, but the maps show that it definitely is a worldwide problem. And here you have um, a map which um, only shows you a problem in children, that is the mortality, the upper panel mort mortality in young children and the lower panel uh, mortality in school children and adolescents. And again, um, we have the largest number in India, but the African subcontinent is um, almost all of the areas are in the dark red, so there we have a big problem, and that um, is partially also explained by the co-occurrence of HIV infection. Now, uh, who really is at the highest risk um, to develop tuberculosis disease, develop problems and potentially die from it? It is different in children and adults um, because the risk depends on age and um, age-related immu and immune status. Um, it is um, greatest in young children below two years of age and infants, and the lowest risk um, um, is between five and ten years of age with an increase then in adolescence. And that is explained because um, the T-cell status in young children is immature, and in Africa, I've shown you, there's also co-incidence um, co, um, uh, of HIV disease, so um, Im um, immunodeficiency, and um, it's also countries with a significant proportion of malnutrition, um, which in explain the um, high risk in children and the higher risk in, in specific countries and areas of the world. Um, the risk to develop this disease is also influenced by the intensity of exposure and the virulence of the organism. So that also explains why young children who have a very close contact to their parents and especially their mo mother um, are at high highest risk if we have a tuber open tuberculosis disease, smear positive disease in the um, caring mother of a young child. Um, it, once you are infected, it, it takes um, up to 12 months to develop disease, and this time may also be shorter in young children with um, a, um, an immature immune system. When they are infected, young children um, are, have a low infectivity, so they will not um, further spread or are unlikely to spread the disease further. In contrast, adolescents behave like adults in terms of spreading the disease. And this is just um, some um, a figure and um, um, 
a table from our handbook of pediatric respiratory medicine where this risk situation highest at the youngest ages is um, put here in the graph and here are some numbers um, according to age. You have um, pulmonary tuberculosis and disseminated disease and both have the highest um, risk here um, at, uh, during the first two years of age. What can you do pre to prevent the widespread um, um, uh, prevention is BCG vaccination, which is a live attenuated vaccine, which um, is in in injected intradermally. And it is um, actually well used in high incidence countries and is used risk adjusted, for example, in the UK, in different areas where there is a high incidence and um, no recommendation for BCG um, uh, vaccination in other areas of the UK. Um, the efficiency seems to depend on um, the country, um, especially in India, the protection rate is lower than, for example, in Africa, um, but there's not really a very good explanation for that. We have to be careful with BCG immune uh, vaccination if, you, if we have coexisting um, immunodeficiency, like HIV disease. Um, so um, there are areas where we have to consider very carefully whether this child can have BCG vaccination. And the other thing you have to consider when you vaccinate a child that this will um, influence your testing once you have, a, um, have, have to assess this child for tuberculosis infection, but I will talk about this um, in the next slides. Now, what can BCG vaccination do? It, it, it doesn't um, provide absolute protection, but can protect, protect against um, uh, systemic disease and against meningitis. Um, in, for the UK, the efficiency has been reported to be as high as 70 to 80%. And this is um, another map from the WHO where you see that in the high incidence countries there is quite a good BCG vaccination coverage. Okay, and now I come to my first question. We have a two-year-old boy born in the UK. He was BCG vaccinated at birth. During a visit to his grandparents in India, his grandmother was diagnosed as having sputum smear positive pulmonary tuberculosis. He then uh, had a TST test, a tuberculin skin test, which showed a, two, a 12 millimeter in duration. So the question is, what would you do in this case? Would you do a chest x-ray? Would you do a CT chest scan? Would you do gastric lavage and look for acid fast bacilli? Would you do an induced sputum for culture? or would you do an interferon gamma test? And you can vote now. So two-year-old boy, BCG vaccinated, visit to a high incidence country exposed to a grandparent sputum smear positive tuberculosis infection. And there we have our result. And um, yes, the, the, it's um, quite um, uh, the the next the uh, you, the majority is right with interferon gamma test would be the next step to um, uh, confirm tuberculosis infection because the TST in this child who was BCG vaccinated might just be positive because of the BCG vaccination. The child is clinically well. Um, but if the, and you, so you would do a chest x-ray um, only if you develop symptoms or if the interferon gamma test is positive. And induced sputum would be um, the um, uh, test of choice um, if you wanted to um, look for infection if the chest x-ray was positive. So. Next question, a neonate was tested for tuberculosis because his father had been diagnosed with smear positive tuberculosis. 
TST and EGRAG interferon gamma test were negative, the child is clinically well. Which is the most appropriate next step? Would you do a chest x-ray, a CT chest scan, gastric lavage for culture and microscopy, and you sputum for culture and microscopy, or would you start isoniazid? A neonate tested for TBC because his father was smear positive. TST and EGRA negative. Can I see the results? Start isoniazid. Yes, that is a correct answer because here you have a child because of the immature immune system and the potentially close contact to an infectious person, you start isoniazid as soon as possible, not waiting for any other test results to protect the child from a disseminated disease. And then you can follow this up with looking for um, um, infection already. Okay, so um, these two cases show you, um, you have to follow a certain protocol in order to distinguish exposure, infection and active disease. We have talked about um, prevention. Um, it's important um, to do um, thorough contract, contact tracing, but I will not um, concentrate on that. Um, so how do you differentiate exposure, latent infection and tuberculosis disease? I, um, in the questions, we had the tuberculin skin test, the TST already, um, and I've told you that we cannot differentiate BCG positive risk, associated positive response, non-tuberculosis microbacteria response um, from true response due to mycobacterium tuberculosis um, infection. And um, the, uh, if we have a positive TST, this can be followed up by the interferon gamma release assay, which measure, measures interferon gamma production of T lymphocytes who are specific to mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this is a much more um, specific test, but both have, uh, or, but it's, it is less sensitive than the tuberculin skin, skin test, and both have the problem that they cannot differentiate latent from active infection. So it helps to define or to identify people who have been exposed and have been um, infected with tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, but cannot differentiate latent from active infection. Um, in, uh, uh, clinic, the, the tuberculosis diagnosis consists of three fundamental steps, not only the immunological um, testing, but it's very important to do a thorough clinical history and physical examination, ask for contact, ask for coughing, ask for temperature, ask for weight loss in more advanced disease, then do imaging, a plain chest x-ray, CT usually only if there are complications of the disease and you have to identify the pathogen either by, by the um, uh, indirect tests, um, assessment of immune response or direct microscopy culture and expert. And I want to um, uh, go into a little bit of detail there. Um, you need multiple respiratory samples, not just one. And um, it is recommended to do at least two deep cough sputum samples, or if that is not possible, two early morning gastric lavages, or if the child cooperates, and there are quite a few centers around the world who can do that even in the youngest children, um, um, do induced sputum, um, including an early morning sample. If that is not possible or you have a specific question because of um, changes on the chest x-ray you may consider bronchoscopy and lavage but this is not the first line step in order to um, diagnose tuberculosis and it all depends on age of the child and presentation um, culture or um, material for culture should be obtained before starting treatment if this is clinically um, justified, only if you have a very severe presentation, you may start treatment without um, obtaining culture samples first. 
And if you have done these samples, you will do a smear microscopy. You will give this for culture and you will give this for um, um, antigen testing, the gene expert testing. Gene expert has been used widely in the high incidence countries and is now recommended as part of the first line workup, but um, uh, it um, is less sensitive than in adults. That is explained because children usually have um, very low density of mycobacteria bacteria, and um, it's difficult to identify, um, some often difficult to identify this in smear. Um, um, microscopy test. The gene expert is more sensitive. Um, it's um, very sensitive if you have a smear positive case, but you see here, and actually I cannot see this very good on my small computer screen, that it very much depends um, on um, the presentation and the severity of the disease, whether um, you will be able to detect um, um, antigen using the um, gene expert testing or not. There is a new urine test, the LRM test, lipoarabinomanan test, um, which um, is also an antigen test, um, uh, part of the cell membrane, but it has also explained by the porky bacillary nature of the disease in children has a relatively low sensitivity and is not a standard test yet. So smear, yes, culture, yes, but the most sensitive um, but not 100% sensitive method is the gene expert testing. Um, when you have established that there is an infection, you have to define whether it's latent or disease. Latent disease means latent tuberculosis infection means you have no symptoms, your imaging is normal, you cannot detect the pathogen in any of your tests, and you only have the immune response, so tuberculin skin test or um, um, uh, ECRA test positive disease is defined as having symptoms and or um, signs on your imaging and or pathogen detection on any of your tests, either culture or um, antigen testing. Now, how is the um, TB treatment or what are the principles of tuberculosis treatment? Um, you have, um, if you have an, a child who is exposed, but um, does not have signs of infection, you have to decide with, uh, what the risk for the individual situation is. And that means if you have neonates and infants who are at very high risk of developing, developing disease and developing severe disease, or if you have a child with a very close household contact, then you will do preventive treatment following exposure, even if you have not signs of infection. And that can be done with a long-term mono treatment with isoniazid or with a three months treatment of isoniazid plus rifampicin, or even as directly observed treatment, um, there are ongoing trials, um, just weekly observed treatment for three months, but this is not licensed in Europe yet. If you have um, diagnosed a latent tuberculosis, so immune response, no, um, uh, no clinical signs of disease, you can also do the mono treatment with INH, but adherence is difficult. Or you do the um, combined treatment of INH plus rifampicin, which you may also do as directly observed treatment, which is um, easier to adhere to for the families and um, is easier to do as directly observed treatment. And again, 12 dose, so weekly observed um, regimen in adolescents older than 12 years. There are also, have also been trials with rifampicin monotherapy for four months if um, INH is not well tolerated. So these are the alternative options and it has to be decided in the center what is the most feasible for the situation. And for a tuberculosis disease, um, you uh, also always have a multi-drug regimen with a two-month intensive phase using 
um, at least four anti-tubercular anti -tubercular drugs. Um, the first line treatment according to WHO is isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamid, and ethambutol. It's the short HRZE. And the two months intensive phase is followed by double treatment, INH plus REFA for four months, or if you have extra pulmonary disease, complicated disease, up to 12 months, and that is HR the combination. Corticosteroids are indicated in the beginning um, and the initiation at the initiation of um, treatment if you have um, a presentation with meningitis and um, most guidelines recommend to use corticosteroids if you have pericarditis, so only systemic disease. These are, uh, is just an overview of, um, over the most commonly used antituberculous drugs in children with the dosages and the side effects that have to be monitored. Um, yes, you can, um, there are some, some literature where you can um, go into more detail. Um, all of the epidemiological effects, the current worldwide guidelines you can find on the very good website of the WHO. And um, now I would just, just want to summarize um, key points, tuberculosis, basics, tuberculosis in children. We have a very high global burden. The predominant areas are Africa, India, and for MDR, Russia and neighboring countries. Children are usually infected through adult contacts. The risk of infection depends very much on the index case. Um, on bacterial load of the index cause, closeness and frequency of contact, age of the child and immune status. And it's always good to remember that the highest risk is in neonates and the very young infants where um, you should um, do everything not to, do let, to delay start of treatment. Diagnosis is based on clinical symptoms history of exposure. And then the first line tests are the tuberculin skin test and the interferon gamma test depending on results and presentation, chest x-ray, and then um, uh, proof of um, infection with direct mic microscopy with very low um, sensitivity in children, culture, better sensitivity, but long term, a long time um, to get a result, and the gene expert antigen testing, which has a good specificity and um, variable sensitivity depending on presentation. In children, um, almost all cases, 80% um, are pulmonary. Um, adolescents usually have adult type disease. BCG is still a valid uh, measure to prevent disseminated and severe disease and is used widely. New um, vaccinations are being developed but are not in a clinical, um, are not in clinical use. Um, treatment is according to diagnosis, whether you have a, a, a child exposed and at high risk, whether you have um, diagnosed a latent tuberculosis infection or whether you have diagnosed active disease, a, combina a monotherapy, a combination of two or an active disease, a combination of at least four drugs, which is in children um, generally well tolerated. And um, these are the basics, and I hand over to my to um, James Sutherland now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Monica, for a very comprehensive overview. Uh, would you like to take some questions now, or are we going to take the questions after the presentation of uh, James? I don't mind. Whatever you want. Okay, well, well, maybe we can tackle some of the questions um, now. There are some experts from India in, in the audience as well and from South Africa. And I think they agree that for microbiological diagnosis, uh, gastric lavage and induced sputum is used uh, frequently. Um, there were some questions about BCG. Uh, can you discuss how long does it pr protect against TB and how long will you TST be positive? Mm -hmm. Um, well, how long will it protect from disseminated disease? It will probably um, protect um, through younger childhood. After that, um, the effect will 
decrease um, and it is not a lifelong protection against tuberculosis. So it's mainly for infants and young children and that's why BCG um, vaccination is done um, almost immediately after birth. Um, how long will it affect the TST? That can be much longer and it's, um, there is no way to predict um, how long it will be positive um, in the individual person, but you can have a 10-year-old or 12-year-old with previous BCG vaccination who will still have a positive TST response. Um, therefore, if you have a child with suspected tuberculosis infection, you always have to ask for the BCG history. Yeah, thank you. And there is some confusion about the cases you presented. Um, first, in this baby who had, um, where you started with uh, treatment or prophylaxis, um, one of the comments is, sh shouldn't you make a chest X-ray anyway to exclude if the child has active disease because this will influence the decision how to treat this child? Um, well, I... I the child is only very, very, uh, only few days old, so uh, there is no, um, and there's no sign of infection. If the child had developed miliary disease by that time, you would expect a clinically um, ill child, but I agree, I would start treatment and also do a chest x-ray in this situation. Yeah, I, I think that was the same comment for the first case. Um, so if you want to make a difference between a positive uh, IGRA because of latent infection or active disease, you actually need more investigations. Yeah, now yeah. the emphasis on this case with the neonate is that you don't delay treatment. You start INH and then you do the, the rest of your workup. And then if you then identify more than exposure, then of course you have to adjust your treatment. Um, and, and the older child, I wouldn't agree if there is no sign of infection um, and if all the tests are negative, then um, actually I wouldn't go further. If the TST is strongly positive, then yes, you need a chest X-ray. Yeah. And do you think there's a role for steroids in uh, effusions? Um, the literature says no. And plural effusion, if there is no pericardial in, um, in, uh, effusion, if there is no sign of systemic inflammation, um, there is no advantage of corticosteroids. Yeah, then I think there are some differences in uh, starting regimens for active TB, but I think that this depends on resistance in your local setting. So probably James will talk about uh, that. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on sensitivity and specificity for gene expert on different fluids, gastric lavage or induced sputum? Actually, maybe we can go back to one of the slides because um, this is a very detailed um, graph. Maybe we can even enlarge that. Is that possible? Or maybe yes, we... sure. we're just going to go back to the slides now. Won't be a moment. Yeah. And you can see there that the sensitivity very much depends on the sample. So you can go back now, Monica, to the slide you want. Okay. Yeah. Click on with the math, yeah. yeah. This one. Oops. It's, and now the question is, can we enlarge that? No, we can't. Um, it's very difficult to see. I think when you read it up, you see. Well, may, maybe you can check the reference uh, yeah, for the participant that asked this I question. Will, I will ask, uh, answer this question either in the chat or I will have a chance after the next presentation. Excellent. Well, I suggest that we continue with the next presentation, leaving some minutes for questions after this second presentation. So maybe if we can have the slides of uh, James again. We're making it a little bit more difficult for you, Amy. Yeah, there problem. we are. <laughs> Please, James, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk. Um, my name is James Sudden. I'm um, a senior lecturer at Imperial College, but I, I also work in South Africa. I'm speaking to you from South Africa now, where I work for most of the time. Um, I'm going to talk to you about multidrug resistant TB in children. And for those of you who don't know, multidrug resistant 
means that the organism that's causing the TB is resistant to isoniazid and rifampicin. And Monica's just explained that those are two of the absolute key drugs in the treatment of first-line treatment. So I um, do not have any uh, conflicts. So what I'm going to try and cover is the burden of MDR-TB in children, uh, some of the principles of managing uh, this condition and really how a child would present to you and then think about how to diagnose MDR and um, think about treating it and then a brief update on MDR-TB preventive therapy. So I'll start with <clears throat> the burden. So the first question is how many children develop MDR-TB disease globally each year? How many do we estimate um, and uh, Monica had just explained that about a million children a year get TB or are estimated to develop TB. Only a, less than a half of those are diagnosed. Um, so how many get MDR TB a year? Has everyone voted? If you haven't voted, vote quickly. Great, I'm going to show the results. Okay, so there's quite a good spread, um, but 30,000 seems to be um, about the most popular number, which would be 3% of, of TB cases in children. Okay. Right, so how... Um, so... Uh, oh, that's a bit slow to me around. So in terms of uh, the burden of MDR-TB in children, um, there have been a number of modelling studies which have looked at this because actually a very small proportion of those cases are diagnosed, are put on treatment and are reported to WHO. So we've had to use some modelling approaches to estimate um, how many they are based on uh, estimates of incidence in each country and the estimates of drug resistance to come up with a total proportion. And generally estimates fall in at around 30,000. So two groups ha have done this and have come in at about the same level. And this um, cartogram, this map, shows the map of countries with MDR-TB. And as um, Monica showed, the, the size of the country represents the number of MDR-TB cases and the colour represents the proportion of TB cases that are drug resistant. So even though the countries in the former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, have high um, proportions of drug resistance because there's so much TB in sub-Saharan Africa and India and China, you actually get um, large numbers of MDR-TB cases in those countries as well. And what about in Europe? Well, um, uh, last year or the year before, um, this guidance document was put out, and I suggest you read this if you're interested in MDR-TB in Europe, but the estimate is that there are 13,500 cases of TB in Europe, in the WHO European region, which includes Russia going all the way to the Bering Straits. Um, and within that, there are just over 2,000 MDR-TB cases. And that translates into 16% of TB in child is MDR-TB, and nearly 30% has isoniazid resistance. So in the WHO European region, we have some of the highest rates of drug resistance in the world. So how do we approach management? <coughs> So effectively, children can present in one of two ways to the clinician. They can either, and I'm, I'm starting at the top, you can either ex, uh, present having been exposed. So they've been identified, adults been diagnosed, and the child's been um, identified as having been exposed. The other way is a child presents with symptoms of TB disease, and, and the clinician needs to decide whether this is TB or something else. So the first step in everything you do is to try and decide whether they have disease or not. And that might require history examination, radiology, um, et cetera, et cetera. But once you then, and then you make a decision, either this is unlikely TB disease or likely TB disease. If it's unlikely TB disease, you then need to think about whether this could be MDR-TB infection. And if it is MDR infection or likely to be, you think about MDR-TB preventive therapy. If you think uh, going down the right-hand side, this could be disease, you then need to think, could this be MDR-TB disease? And if it is, then you need to decide on your drug and regimen. But ultimately, all these children do need some kind of therapy, and you need to get to the bottom of what the diagnosis is. On the left, you see the tuberculin skin test and interferon gamma release assay, which may help you make a decision about infection therapy. And then we've got some images on the right of children with, with very severe spinal TB at the top and then um, intrathoracic lymph node disease on below. In terms of diagnosing MDR-TB, <clears throat> we have a number of categories. So um, children start with having a clinical diagnosis of TB. They've got um, signs and symptoms of radiology that's characteristic of TB. 
And if they're confirmed, that's relatively easy. You have a lot of confidence that they've got MDR-TB and you can start an appropriate therapy um, tailored to the drug resistance profile of that organism that you've isolated. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen in that many cases. That is probably in 20 or 30% of children we should be treating for MDR-TB. So then you, you're left with a group of children who, 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 who you have to assume have MDR. And they can either have probable MDR-TB, and that, in, that, that is really where you have a child with a clinical diagnosis of TB who have been exposed to a confirmed case of MDR-TB. So you've got a child, a four-year-old girl, who's, who's um, coughing and losing weight and has a characteristic X-ray, and her father has smear positive MDR-TB confirmed. But you also have this category of possible MDR-TB, and that could be um, that the child is failing a well-adhered to first-line regimen, or they've got clinical TB and they've been in contact with a source case who has high risk for resistance. So they've either failed therapy or they've um, defaulted or they've died. And <clears throat> it's a balance. For the confirmed diagnosis, it's relatively straightforward. But for these um, cases which are not confirmed, you have to weigh up a risk. And there's a risk if you don't do anything, the child doesn't get treated, they are left to develop some more severe MDR-TB and that may be more difficult to treat and it might be associated with more lung damage or more neurological impairment or the child may actually ultimately die. But there is also a risk of, of activity of treating for, for presumed MDR-TB. You might be treating them unnecessarily, they may be getting toxic medicines and there may be costs associated with this. So you have to weigh this up. Um, but on balance, I think on most of the time, if you think this child is a, a reasonable risk of having MDR-TB, you should err on the side of treating. So we come to our next question. If you have an adult who's got MDR-TB diagnosed in a household and the child who's living with them has TB, what is the risk they've got MDR-TB? So what is the concordance amongst strains within households for MDR-TB? And this is a really crucial question because <clears throat> if you have a child who's got unconfirmed disease or you've got a child with infection in the household now, you need to know how confident are you that you're going to treat MDR-TB or whether you should just say, look, there's a low risk of MDR, I'll treat for something else. Has everyone voted? Okay, and um, again, a spread of votes, but the most popular is 80%. And recently, um, I've been involved in a systematic review in Metronas, which has just come out in Clinical Infectious Diseases, which does answer this question. And it really says that um, it looked at all the studies that have tried to evaluate the concordance in drug resistance profiles between index cases and contacts. And for MDR, for the concordance between just INH and RIF, the concordance is just above 80%. So this is a forest plot where they take all the studies and they look at how what the proportion was and, and sum them. And so the... the <clears throat> diamond at the bottom is the sum of all those studies put together at about 82%. So I think that what this says is if you have an MDR case in a household and you have a child who's, who's got clinical disease but doesn't have confirmed disease, you can be pretty confident they have the same um, source case. Equally, if you have an adult who's got TB and a child who's got infection in a well and you want to give them some preventive therapy, you can be fairly confident they're infected by a drug-resistant uh, strain. Okay, and how do you approach this? So the first step, if you've got this presumed case, so they're not confirmed, they're the presumed case, probable or possible. The first thing you really must do is obtain biological samples. So um, as Monica was saying, this can be a juice sputum, gastric aspiration or expectorated sputum if the child is older. Um, uh, but, and I think for drugs susceptible, you probably should collect samples in all children, but I, I don't think it's as important as drug resistant. Drug resistant, it really is mandatory. And then you have two options. I, I would say for most of these children, if you think that they've got clinical disease and there's a likelihood they have MDR, you should start treatment straight away. And then when you get the, um, if you get a result back, it will either confirm some other DST, drug susceptible or monoresistant, or it will confirm MDR, um, or you get a non-confirmed, which is often very possible. You just, it, it doesn't grow anything, the, the culture or the expert, and, and you continue treatment or you treat according to it. The other option, I think, it's not unreasonable if you have, if you're really unclear whether they've got TB or not, or if the index case with MDR was, was a bit more peripheral and less intense, you might want to watch your weight. You're, you're waiting for the organism. So if you then develop, get an organism, you can, um, you can treat according to the pattern of that. So either drug susceptible or drug resistant. But if you don't get an organism, 
um, then you can monitor the child and, and if you're concerned, then you can start MDR TB treatment. So this is just one approach for how to handle children who, who may or may not have MDR TB. In terms of treatment, <laughs> so this was done a couple of years ago, a systematic review and meta-analysis on an individual level of all children um, in the world up to that point who had ever been treated for MDR TB, about a thousand children. So a, that's sort of very impressive, but also it's disappointing that only a thousand children in the world ever have been reported as having treated for MDR TB. But what it does show is that unlike adults, where successful outcome is only in about 50% of cases or was previously only in about 50% of cases, children do really well. So confirmed diagnoses, over 90% clinically diagnosed patients, even higher. So what this is saying that is if you do diagnose and start a child in MDR TB treatment, um, it, it, outcomes are very good. And generally, the outcomes are pretty safe as well. <coughs> and up until about um, five years ago, things were very straightforward. If a child had MDR TB, they had 18 months of therapy, of which the first six required an injectable. And you gave six or seven drugs and you just gave them all the same thing, irrespective of what uh, extent of disease or DST pretty much. And so that takes you down the left hand side um, really of this path with 18 months, including an injectable. But then some evidence came through on this shortened regimen, originally from Bangladesh and then trialed in the STREAM trial, which said that we could give nine to 12 months, a shortened regimen, which was very exciting. Also more and more evidence is coming to light that children with limited disease can be treated for more um, shorter durations of therapy. And then increasingly, people are not using injectables because they're associated with significant ototoxicity. And with the new drugs coming in with bedaquil and delaminid, people are emitting injectables or using substitutions. And you're left with a very confusing time, I think, at the moment for people making decisions about MDR-TB, about whether to use longer regimens, shortened longer regimens, or use the shorter regimen, or use a shorter regimen in total, and you, whether or not. So I find, personally, this is all very confusing. So I'm going to move on to what I think is a slightly more straightforward way of designing MDR-TB treatment regimens. But first of all, I'm going to ask you, which of the following is not a group A or group B drug as classified by the WHO in their most recent drug classifications? And A and B drugs are the drugs that are the core to developing a regimen for uh, individuals with MDR-TB. Everyone voted. Okay, we've got a good spread here. So most people think bedaquiline is not a group A or B drug, but there are quite a lot of people who think um, a variety of other medicines. And this is the most recent WHO drug classification. So the absolute core drugs that you need to use are <coughs> the fluoroquinolones, bedaquiline and lenezolid, <coughs> and then uh, clofazamine and either cyclosyria and terizidone, similar agents. And, and this is quite a, a new revision. Uh, bedaquiline and delaminid are new drugs that have been developed specifically for TB in the last five or 10 years. And then we have lenezolid and clofazamine, which are drugs that have been around for a bit longer, but have been repurposed for TB. They weren't being used for TB 10 years ago. And this is exciting. And, and this is really developed from an individual patient systematic review in adults, which has showed that these are the best drugs for, for treating TB. And what's also, I think, very nice is that the injectables are really being found to not be very effective. And also because they're associated with quite high adverse events in terms of ototoxicity, we really shouldn't be using them as readily. So how do you construct your regimen? Well, WHO suggests you, you use all the drugs from group A that you can. So you use one of levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, bedaquiline, linezolid, and then you add drugs from group B that you can, clofazamine and isocyclosyria and trizodone. And then you add group C drugs until you have four active drugs prescribed. Now, the one complexity in this situation is that bedaquiline we can't use in the youngest children. We don't have appropriate safety and pharmacokinetic data to use in children under six years. And we don't have appropriate formulations. And for delaminid, we can't use it in the youngest, youngest children. So the children under three years old. So although this is nice and straightforward for adults, actually for children, we need to have, be a bit more um, aware of the age bands. And so for the youngest children, 
we um, we can use a regimen depending on whether they're fluoroquine alone resistant or fluoroquine sensitive. Um, and then as the different age bands, you can construct different regimens. But sticking with the principle that where possible, use all the group A drugs and all the group B drugs, but obviously substituting other drugs in when you can't use vodaclinid or lamanid because of the age bands. But for children above age six, we should be following that WHO construction regimen. And how long do you treat for? Well, I, I think there isn't a one size fits all. It'd be nice to say that all children need a year's treatment or 18 months or six months, but actually uh, we're, it, it doesn't seem fair to treat everyone for the longest possible duration where we know that those with non-severe disease don't need as long therapy. So those with really severe disease, extensive parenchymal disease, um, if you have cavities, severe miliary disease, they may well need 18 months of therapy. But for children with intrathoracic hyalur lymph node disease or cervical lymph nodes, you probably can get away with nine to 12 months of therapy if you're giving them these effective drugs. And um, yeah, I've talked about this already. So yeah, so it's effectively we are, we are, we're still learning, um, but we, I think you don't need to think that every child needs 18 months of therapy. There are lots and lots of clinical trials going on at the moment on MDR-TB. Um, it's a really exciting time and lots of new drugs using the, the lamidid, bedaquilin, the fluoroquinolones, using protominid, which is a new drug, um, and it's very exciting. But unfortunately, none of these trials include any children, which is very disappointing. And although we can learn lessons for these trials for children, I think it's a shame that children have not been included to date. There is one clinical trial which is due to start later this year, which will take about 150 children and treat with an exciting six-month regimen, which will include um, linezolid, bedaquilin, delaminid, and levofloxin, with linezolid just for the first two months. And I think this, if this shows that this is, is, is safe and is um, associated with high, good treatment outcomes, I think this would be a major step forward in treating children uh, for shorter, safer durations of therapy. So moving on to MDR-TB infection. So this systematic review came out a few years ago. It was a review of observational studies, so very flawed systematic review in many ways. But it did show, if you look at the, the outcome on the right, that a substantial risk reduction of 90% was seen if you give child contacts of MDR-TB um, uh, preventive therapy tailored to the infection of the source case. And a consensus statement developed a few years ago really overwhelmingly suggested that children, uh, particularly young children, should be given some kind of preventive therapy. And even the most recent, oh, even the most recent WHO guidance suggests that it is appropriate to give MDR preventive therapy in certain circumstances. These slides are jumping all over the place a bit. Okay, so yeah, I, don't, I don't need to read through this, but this is really saying that um, the WHO does even endorse MDR preventing therapy in certain circumstances. <clears throat> These are not actually responding. Are you okay there? Are we having a... Yeah, they're, they're just, um, they're not going up and down really. It might pay just to. If you can take me to the next question, if you can move them. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay, okay so um, if people could, uh, we're nearly there. The final question which of the following is uh, an MDR TB prevention trial? There are three MDR TB prevention trials going on at the moment. Um, so we should have an idea of effective MDR TB prevention in the next couple of years. Um, so which of these is one of those three? Okay. Has everyone voted? Okay, so again, a good spread with treat TB, um, treat MDR, the most popular. So actually the answer is VQIN. There are three MDR prevention trials. TB Champ is looking just at children under five years. The Phoenix trial is is looking at adults and children, and then VQIN is mainly looking at adults. 
Um, two of the trials are using levofloxin and one is using delaminid. And the TB champ trial is the one um, that's going on in South Africa, which is just in children under five years. Um, and yeah, here we go. So it's going to randomize a thousand children into two arms, levofloxin or placebo. So in conclusion, I think there are really exciting times for MDR-TB. There are quite large numbers of MDR-TB globally and in Europe, um, and few of them are treated. And we are getting better and better at treating children for MDR-TB with very good outcomes and with shorter and safer regimens. And we're having a better idea of how to treat MDR-TB infection as well. But unfortunately, there's still a long way to go. Well, thank you, James, for a very good overview on multidrug resistant TB. Uh, I would also like to thank the attendees for their active contribution in the chat, because there are some experts, I think, from India and South Africa. Um, one of the questions in the chat to you, James, uh, can you um, uh, talk a little bit more about this difference between probable and possible TB? How do you make this difference? Uh, so the definition just comes TV. out of consensus. Yeah, no, I mean, this came out of a consensus group that tried to define these for research purposes mainly. Um, and probable is where you have a child who's got clinical diagnosis of disease, i.e. very likely to have TB, and they've been exposed to a confirmed case of MDR-TB. That's termed probable. And then possible is, is a, very, a child with very likely clinical disease, who has been either failing first-line therapy, so you think maybe there's some reason why they're failing therapy, or they've been exposed to a source case who has risk factors for MDR-TB. Those have been classified as, as possible MDR cases. Okay, thank you. Um, I, there's one question about infants with households who have uh, non, uh, MDR-TB. Um, how would you treat a child, an infant who has been exposed with with a positive uh, um, Montu test? Well, I think I think the first step is always to rule out these, whether it's drug susceptible or drug resistant. Monica alluded to this as well. We need to be confident that they don't have M uh, d TB disease. Um, if you are confident, whether through clinical examination or radiology, um, or both then I would give that child an MDR-TB preventive therapy regimen. We don't know what the best regimen is yet, but observational studies suggest that a fluoroquinolone-based regimen daily for six months, probably just levofloxacin on its own daily for six months, is probably an appropriate regimen. There are two questions about uh, wearing masks for adults and also for children with multidrug resistant TB in the society. Do you have an opinion about that, Monica and James? That's a difficult question. I um, think an adult um, with possible aerosol generation and um, who is not uh, safely treated, um, there is a role for um, personal protection. I, I don't know. With an infant, I wouldn't be. Uh, I wouldn't recommend wearing a mask because um, there is almost no chance that um, this child will generate aer aerosols that can be distributed in the environment. Yeah, I think in some countries, uh, if I understand the questions correctly, um, adults have to have to wear a mask uh, when they are just diagnosed with TB. Um, but I agree, it's children are not very infectious and it will be really difficult to have an infant with a wearing a mask i would say but i think i think the answer is that the people looking after um the children um you know i think should think about the infection control risk because although young children are, are very low risk as they get older and especially into adolescence they they certainly can transmit bacteria so i think if i was going into the room of an adolescent who had um either drug susceptible or drug resistant tb I would be very keen to wear a mask, but within a few, you know, within a few days and definitely within a couple of weeks of effective therapy, probably they aren't infectious. Okay. Uh, then there were two questions, and maybe that's interesting in this um, uh, Corona pandemic about the um, uh, protection of BCG 
uh, against COVID-19. So there have been trials uh, vaccinating people with BCG to see if this impacts uh, the risk of developing COVID. Can you comment on that? I can only guess, maybe this is more a question for James Seddon. Um, it's um, stimulation of the immune system and having a more flexible response to uh, new pathogens that will protect, um, but maybe something T cell specific. James, do you know? I've had, I've had a vaccine uh, to BCG as part of a coronavirus trial, so I've, I've enrolled in okay. a trial. Um, the bottom line is we don't know. I think there's the strong epidemiological data to say that some um, countries that have high BCG vaccines were slower to have coronavirus, but it, it was so flawed that I think that um, it, it's quite questionable. There is a hypothesis BCG does all kinds of things to your immune system and it modulates the way we respond to other vaccines and other pathogens. So it's very plausible, but it needs to be evaluated in clinical trials, I think. So you will come with the answer next year at uh, summer school. I think uh, this is an, uh, was a nice question to end uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to thank you both for a very nice presentation on TB and all the participants for all their questions and active contribution to the discussions. So we have a very short break again for 10 minutes and we'll be, we'll be, we will be back at uh, 2.30.